We're going to start the uh, eighth chapter of Ecclesiastes this morning. Who is like a wise man, and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the sternness of his face is changed. Um, we've known several people, had the privilege of knowing several people here uh, who would come to church from time to time, and then they got saved. And, and their countenance completely changed. I'm thinking of Brother, Brother Rudolph. You know, he walked into a room and nobody, at least into this room, and nobody had to say what happened to you because it was so obvious. Um, his countenance changed so much. A man's wisdom makes his face shine and the sternness of his face has changed. His parents, his, his appearance changed, his demeanor changed, his tone of voice changed. And that's what happens when we, when we repent and when we let the Holy Spirit dwell in us. Verse 2, I say, keep the king's commandment for the sake of your oath to God. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This reminds me of 1 Peter 2.13 that says, Obey every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Uh, if, we, if, we, if we take the law very casually, we don't take it seriously. If we, um, uh, if we cheat on our taxes, if we don't have any regard for traffic laws or speed limits, then the world looks at us and they don't see anything different. Um, it's for the Lord's sake. Obey every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Give the world looking at us and watching us nothing to find fault with. Uh, Romans 12.1 says, Be subject to every authority. And it's the same principle. We're not, we're not here to buck authority. We're not here to argue with authority. We are here to be subject to authority to set a good example for those around us and in so doing bring legitimacy to our testimony. You have to be careful that what they're telling you is not against God's law. That, that, that's true. Um, and, and the Bible is clear that there are or there can be times when, when it is appropriate. I'm uh, thinking about Peter talking to the Sanhedrin and said, "You tell us, should we uh, should we obedient to you or should we obedient be obedient to God?" But I think I think God will arrange if if God wants us uh, if He wants us persecuted by the authorities. He will arrange that. We don't need to provoke that. Um, there was a time in the third and fourth centuries in particular when the prevailing doctrine was that if you wanted to be absolutely, absolutely certain of your place in heaven, you needed to be martyred. That was the one way to be sure of it. And they would willfully go out and provoke the Roman authorities. Willfully buck the authorities, publicly do it, um, to the point where they had to be burned at the stake or tossed to the animals uh, and they did that because they believed that, that was the one sure way to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life and of course the well, Bible doesn't believe that. what's that? The Muslims still believe that the Muslims still believe that one sure way to get killed I don't know about the modern <laughs> well and, and, and Jesus in fact said to his apostles when he sent them out he said to his disciples and his apostles when he sent them out, he said, if they persecute you in this city, flee to the next. Don't hang around to get persecuted and prosecuted and martyred. If God wants you martyred, he'll arrange it. 
we don't decide what our fate is. God does. In the meantime, keep the king's commandment for the sake of your oath to God. Do not be hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand for an evil thing, for he does whatever pleases him. Um, Paul tells us that the authority does not wield the sword in vain, that God has placed him there to maintain law and order. And we are supposed to be a part of order. God is not the author of chaos. Whether he's a godly king or a godly president or not is not the point. Us not bucking the system, us not, us be doing our part to preserve the peace is the point. And when we do that, people, when we fail to do that, when we don't do that, when we rock the boat, um, and a lot, of, a lot of people think that they need to rock the boat to bring attention to themselves. But when we willfully rock the boat uh, in order to bring attention to ourselves, I don't believe that honors God. When we willfully cooperate and we are filled with the peace and the joy that surpasses understanding, and, that, and we have that countenance about us from the wisdom of God, that's what gives legitimacy. That's what attracts people to our testimony. Wherever the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say to him, what are you doing? He who keeps his command will experience nothing harmful. And a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment, because for every matter there is a time and judgment, though the misery of man increases, increases greatly. Regardless of what situation is, there is a right response. There's a wrong response. And, and God is the one who can reveal to us what that right response is. A wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment, because for every matter there is a time and judgment, though the misery of man increases greatly. Even in the, as we often say, on the mountaintops and on the valleys, regardless of what our situation, regardless of our conditions, regardless of how grim things look or how good things look, there is, there is a right way and a wrong way, and God will reveal that to us for he does not know what will happen. So who can tell him when it will occur? We don't know what tomorrow's got. We don't know what this afternoon has in store. And so to seek and be led by God at all times is, is the right course of action, regardless of how grim things look or regardless of how, thing, how good things look. Um, I've had people say to me, well, Ted, it's easy for you easy for you to worship God. You have it made. You've got everything a person could want. It's easy for you. And yet, you know, Jesus says basically just the opposite. He says it is as difficult for a rich person to get into heaven as it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Um, we, and we see oftentimes just the opposite. We've had people come in here and say, you remember me? Uh, refresh my memory. Well, I had this problem, I had this problem, and I needed prayer, and I was here, I was here last year for prayer, and the problem was solved, and I, now I got another problem, I'm back. I haven't been back since, but I'm back. I'm back, I've got a problem, and I'm, and I'm back. So, so there are people who cry out to God when there's things going wrong, there are people who praise God when things are going right. We, as God's people, need to always be in a state of worship to God. Verse 8, no one has power over the Spirit to retain the Spirit. The one exception, of course, being God, who said, I have the authority to lay my life down. I have the authority to take it up. We don't. And no one has power in the day of death. There is no release from that war, and wickedness will not deliver those who are given to it. We can't scheme our way out of dying. We can't be so wealthy or so devious or so anything as to prevent God taking our life at the time He has preordained for our life to end. 
he ordains when and where we are born well have we been trying for millennia to to put off what God has ordained you know with the right amount of money you can get yourself cryogenically preserved so that when science well, you can get yourself frozen well <laughs> freeze dried freeze dried right amount of money you get yourself stitched up where you don't look old anymore. You look like a fish, but you don't look old. Nine, all this I have seen and applied my heart to every work that is done under the sun. There is a time in which one man rules over another to his own hurt. Then I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of holiness and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of holiness. The fact that somebody shows up for church every Sunday does not make them holy. Um, in fact, uh, in fact there are a lot of people who there are people who go to church every Sunday in an effort to conceal the fact that they are fundamentally wicked and know that they are wicked. And the fact is that as the end draws near, more and more people will turn from sound doctrine to that which tickles the ear. I They had come and gone from the temple. They had been regulars in the temple. But they were still wicked people. And they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This also was vanity. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Of the fact is that life is not fair and we've discussed this many times in the book of Ecclesiastes and people who do wicked things often get away with it for now and because of that um, they believe they're just going to continue to get away with it and um, that's been the same I think that's been the same for all all time it reminds me of a verse in 2nd Peter It says, uh, Beloved, this is the chapter 3 of Second Peter, I, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. People don't see an immediate cause and effect, and therefore, therefore, there, there's no incentive in them to change their ways and do good. I'm reminded of a verse, and I didn't look it up, so I don't know what verse it is in Proverbs, but it says to discipline a child swiftly so that that child associates, associates misbehaving, rebellion, um, poor choices with punishment. And you want to do that swiftly so that there's that association. But life doesn't necessarily do that. Sometimes we make a poor choice and we pay for it right away. But oftentimes evil people do evil things and and as it says, the sentence against the evil work is not executed speedily. There is a sentence. And for those who are led by their flesh, who are led by their evil ways and do not repent, the sentence is eternity in hell separated from God. But they don't see that immediately upon doing their evil work. Therefore, the, hearts of son, the heart of sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. They get away with it. They think they're getting away with it, and so they just continue doing it. 
Though a sinner does evil a hundred times, and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before Him. Uh, read the 37th Psalm. It, it says, do not over evildoers who prosper in their ways. Um, know, know that the day will come when they are recompensed by God for their works. And even, and even though the righteous may not appear to prosper, sense of the word prosper um, they will be rewarded ultimately be rewarded by in fact they're rewarded here and now with the peace and the joy and the hope that the rest of the world cannot possibly know but will be rewarded will be rewarded with an eternity in the presence of the glory of God The Bible says that we must know that God is and that he, he is a rewarder of those who seek Him diligently. But it will not be well with the wicked, nor will He prolong His days, which are as a shadow, because He does not fear before God. He may do evil a hundred times and get away with it, but it will not be well with him because God has the last word. God is in control. Verse 14, there is a vanity which occurs on earth that there are just men to whom it happens according to the work of the wicked. Again, there are wicked men to whom it happens according to the work of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity and all Solomon is saying here is that life's not fair. Um, we've quoted this verse many times. 1 Peter 2.20 says, When you do what is right and you suffer for it. Not if you do what is right, but when you do what is right and you suffer for it and you endure it patiently, this finds favor with God. The Bible is very, very clear that life is not fair and that we just simply need to know that God is not Nothing is escaping God, and that evil people will be recompensed for their evil, ultimately, and that the righteous will be recompensed for their righteousness. Those who trust in the Lord will be recompensed for trusting in the Lord. Verse 15, so I commended enjoyment, because a man has nothing better under the sun than to eat, drink, and be merry, for this will remain with him in his labor all the days of his life, which God gives him under the sun. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, even though one sees no sleep day or night, then I saw all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. For though a man labors to discover it, yet he will not find it. Moreover, though a wise man attempts to know it, he will not be able to find it. So, Solomon has advised us to eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of our hand in a number of places. Um, in most of them, he's very clear to point out that it's a gift of God that we can enjoy the fruits of our own hands. Um, this is verse three, chapter 312, verse 12. I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives, and that also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. And I would go a step farther and say that if, that if we do not rejoice, if we are not thankful for those things we have, whether it's a, an RV or a grass hut or a mansion, whether it's a uh, a ketchup sandwich or a T-bone steak and baked potato, whatever it is, if we are not thankful, um, God is very um, displeased. We are to be grateful for all things and thankful in all things, whether a little or whether a lot. We're to be thankful. We're to receive those things with thanksgiving. Paul says if we have shelter and food with these, we shall be content. 
I'm going to pick back up at the end of that verse. For though a man labors to discover it, yet he will not find it. Moreover, though a wise man attempt to know it, he will not be able to find it. Talking about the business done on earth, the work of God. I saw the work of God that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. Um, though a man labor to discover it, yet he will not find it. Moreover, though a wise man attempts to know it, he will not be able to find it. God will do what God will do, and he is not obligated to share it with us or explain it to us or give us the ability to understand it. One of the things that I certainly am looking forward to, the Bible says that we will understand those things when we become as he is. When we become a spiritual thing, then we will see spiritual things. And, you know, I get tickled because I hear a lot of people say, you know, I'm going to ask God about that when I get to heaven. I got a few questions for God. I don't think so. I think we're going to understand. I, all those questions are going to be answered. We're not going to have any need to ask God questions. Chapter 9, For I considered all this in my heart, so that I could declare it all, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. People know neither love nor hatred by anything they see before them. Even our emotions are gifts from God, and we can't understand them. You could take the world's greatest supercomputer and plug in everything known about the human brain, and it would still not predict love and hatred and, and, and the emotions. Um, in fact, you can take the greatest supercomputers on Earth and plug in everything we, every, every parameter we know about the atmosphere, and it still would not predict lightning. Scientists are pulling their hair out, it, it, devoting entire careers to trying to figure out lightning. They understand that a huge charge builds up here, a positive charge at one end and a negative charge at one, another end, and, and at some point there's a discharge. Still, ha still, still, can't, still can't make a computer create enough charge to, to result in lightning. I love it, you know. I love, I love being on the back porch in a pouring down rain and pulling out my computer, pulling out my, pull, pulling out my computer out of my pocket, and going to weather.com and having it say zero percent chance of rain. <laughs> love it, <laughs> love it. Or, or it's bright and sunny, and I'm thinking, golly, are we ever going to get a break? And I'm looking at my, I'm looking at my phone, and it says 100 percent of, 100 percent chance of rain. It's, it's raining. It's raining at your location. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I just, um, to me it's just affirmation that God does what God will do and he has not gifted us to, um, to second guess him. One evil happens to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good, the clean, and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As is the good, so is the sinner. He who takes an oath, as he who fears an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that one thing happens to all. Truly the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead. But for him who is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. Solomon is not saying that God is wicked at, by any stretch of the imagination. What he is saying is that, that we all live and die in an unfair world and, and we all face death. Um, I'm going to just jump ahead. Where, where Solomon is headed with all this is, is the last verse of the, of the book. 12.13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. 
Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret, secret thing, whether good or evil. So Solomon is not saying you might as well do wickedly because doing good doesn't make any difference. He's not saying that at all. He is, he is laying down his observations and setting us up to understand why it is so much better for us to do good, why wisdom is so much better than foolishness. And regardless of the consequences that we seem to experience on earth, we need to continue to do good. We need to continue to seek wisdom and righteousness regardless of, of, of what the response appears to be. Um, I love what Paul says, do not, do not grow weary of doing good, for in due time we shall reap. Chapter 9, verse 5, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Now, he doesn't mean that we're not recompensed for what we've done in our life, but he's saying, in the world, under the sun, in this life, it's over with. Um, as Brother David says, there are no more opportunities to repent. There are no more opportunities to confess. There are no more opportunities to reach out and share our testimony with our friends and neighbors once we've died. Our ability to do things here and now on this earth comes to an end when we die. And for those of us who God sees fit to know we are dying, some people know that they're going to die, some people don't. Um, I, for one, don't want to lie on my deathbed just, you know, ate up with all the things I should have done for the kingdom and didn't do. Um, and we should, we should have that, we should keep that in mind. The living know that they will die. Knowing that we will die, what are we going to do about it? Just put it out of our mind and not think about it. Just, just, just put it off. Disregard it. Um, Peter says it like this. Um, knowing this then, how should we live? I'm going I'm to turn to it so I don't get it wrong. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? It's a rhetorical question. Does that mean the more we look, the more it hastens him to come back? Uh, what what, I, I take that to mean that the more we were aware we are of the fact that he is returning, the more it should motivate us to live godly and take advantage of that period. That period's getting shorter every day. It's not going to change the time that he's got to sit I don't believe we're going to change the time he has set. I mean, even Jesus says, of that day and time, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, but only my Father. I think that day is set. We hasten, I think when he says we hasten that day, I think what he's saying is, as we become more and more aware of it, it should motivate us to, to live like we know that day is upon us. Like it's tomorrow, because like it could very well be tomorrow. Verse 6, also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore they will have a share, nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. And remember when he says under the sun, he means here on earth, um, as opposed to in eternity. The things that we loved, the things that we cherished, the things that we hated, the things that we invested so much time on, 
aside from those things that were for the kingdom, for the work of the kingdom, those treasures we light up in heaven, all those things will be gone. Verse 7, Go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already accepted your works. Let your garments always be white, and let your head lack no oil. It is okay for us to enjoy this life. Paul says in 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 1 Timothy 6.17 that God has given us richly all things to enjoy. And his expectation is that we do enjoy them. For us not to enjoy them is for us to say what? God, you didn't do good enough here. If you'd have given me a little more, I would have enjoyed it. If you'd, if you'd, have, if you'd have been a better God, I would have appreciated it. Is that what we're saying? Go, eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has already accepted your works. He is specifically speaking to the righteous here. Let your garments always be white and let your head lack no oil. Um, don't, don't, don't spend your time throwing a pity party. Uh, Jesus talks about the, those who, who fast and contort their faces and just make sure everybody knows they're fasting so people can say, whoa, he's... He is torturing himself for the Lord. He's, he's, he's scoring some points now. I think that's the same thing that Solomon is saying. And I think that also um, might be referring to, to also wisdom and knowledge. Because I think yeah. we can allow the lack of yeah. knowledge to take our joy. Like things that we don't know allow that to be mm -hmm. uh, taken our joy away. And uh, I guess the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. So if that's the case, then you realize that the joy you have cannot go away because of the things you just simply don't know. So I think when he says in verse 7, uh, go your way and your bread with joy and drink your wine, I think we also refer here to the knowledge we have. What we have it's what we should be content with and not just let our joy go away because we don't know. And then what I thought you were going to say is, is that we are trying to get people to receive our testimony. And if we're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and happy and joyous, especially if we're joyous and we're peaceful, people see that. It's more attractive. It's much more attractive, exactly. If we're, if we're, just, if we're just, you know, letting ourselves go... Uh, just people aren't gonna, and it's and it's a shame that the world. But but it's 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 like mowing the grass around the church. Uh, God doesn't pick out churches where the grass is the neatest and the flowers are blooming to show up. But people driving by will say they don't care about that building, or they'll say I don't want my children walking from the car to the building. There could be a copperhead in that grass. Um, people do make judgments based on appearance. And I have had people walk up to me and say, Ted, why are you always so happy? <laughs> I thought you'd never ask. I thought you'd never ask. <coughs> so I think that's a, that's, that's a good point, Adon, and, and I think there are a lot of reasons why. Um, now, I was, I was raised that you had your Sunday clothes, your Sunday best clothes. And you put those on on Sunday, you put your tie on, you put your slacks on, and you wore your very, 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 very best. And, and in my lifetime, I've seen that more as an expression of wealth than as an expression of reverence. You know, my nice clothes are nicer than your nice clothes. My nice car is nicer than your nice car. Having said that, to this day, I believe that if I go into the house of prayer, I should be clean. I should, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing my best into the house of God, not to show off, not that I need to show off to God, not that I need to show off to any of you, but I want to show respect. I want to show respect 
for the fact that we are gathering in the name of the, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to be the body of Christ here. And so let your garments always be white and let your head lack no oil. We'll wrap it up there and pick up, um, pick up in ver chapter 9, verse 9 next week. Any closing thoughts? So back to verse 11, I think uh, you mentioned two things here that I would like to just briefly bridge. Um, he says that uh, because sentence against an evil work is not executed as speedily, you know, to which you're probably going to get replies of, well, if it's not going to be executed speedily, how do we know it's going to be executed? And I think by the end of the book, that last verse, uh, 14 of chapter 12, he says that God shall bring every work into judgment. So I think we see the assurance that indeed it will be executed. Mm -hmm. uh, speedily will be, say, everything will be done. Um, with every single thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So I think that um, at the beginning uh, of verse 11, and as you're reading through, you might think, okay, so when is this really going to happen? And then the conclusion, which you know, we might be full going fast forward here, but I think that that certainly is the answer to that, that those things will be known and the judgment will be brought. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. He, I don't think he's implying that execution the that the sentence the sentence will not be executed it just may not be executed speedily but it will right. be executed and God, I think it's because mentally though I'm sorry to cut no you. no go ahead but I think mentally we're sort of um, trained since we're children to think of uh, consequences right away right like mm -hmm. when a child who does something wrong you get punished for it right um, and we don't think of it but the Bible says God's touching on our thoughts, you know, that's why it's on our way. So it's difficult for us to sort of think of those terms, but they are there. So even if evil does have consequences at the time, we might think, okay, they're just getting away with it. We know what the Bible says otherwise. Well, even as children, like you say, you know, if if we do something we know we shouldn't do, we 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 train ourselves that if I can hide it, if I can hide it for about 24 hours. You know, it'll be history, and I won't get caught, and I won't have to pay for it. Um, which is, again, the, re the reason the book of Proverbs says to, to discipline a child swiftly so that they associate. But God doesn't do that, and I believe God doesn't do that because uh, if, if everything we did in life was too immediately cause and effect... Yeah, and, and, and it, wouldn't really be, it wouldn't really be free choice after a while if... if uh, you know, if every time something came out of my mouth that shouldn't, I, I, I started, you know, heaving and throwing up, I'd learn not to let that stuff come out of my mouth pretty quick. God's, God's not trying to train us in that respect. He wants us to willingly choose Him. He wants us to willingly receive the offer of repentance and the gift of the Holy Spirit. He wants us, He wants to fill up with heaven with people who have, who have, willingly received that gift not have been forced to receive that gift but have willingly received that gift and I think if I think if every time we did wrong we were instantly punished we would just we just get trained we'd be we'd be like we'd be like cell phones we'd be like robots um, in short order which is not what God wants he gave us free will um, he made life unfair and he forces us to say even though life is unfair I truly 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 know that God is in heaven, that he's not missing any of this, and, and that I need to repent, I need to surrender my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and I want to be, and I do fear the Lord, and I do love the Lord, and I do want to please the Lord, and that we, and that we choose the course of, of uh, we choose the course of righteousness over the course of our own flesh. Good morning.